Healthcare is changing, and Dr. Nancy R.N. is here for you. The topics are many, but each program stands on its own with three key action points for you to learn. Your guide to a healthier you in a changing world. Dr. Nancy R.N. Welcome to Dr. Nancy R.N., Healthy You, Healthy Nation, Healthy World. I'm Nancy Valentine, PhD and registered nurse, and this show is dedicated to you, the healthcare consumer. And today we have a topic that is part of a series that we've done on head and neck cancers, and we have a wonderful speaker with us today and guest. And our topic uh, title is Talking Sense of Head and Neck Cancer. What do you need to know? And our guest today is Dr. Sarah Kagan from the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing, and she also works at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. Let me introduce uh, Sarah and her incredibly illustrious background. Um, Sarah started out as a, a student in the behavioral sciences where she got a degree from the University of Chicago and then decided to go to nursing and attended Rush University in Chicago as well and then got a master's degree in gerontological nursing and uh, science and a PhD from the University of California San Francisco. But the work that she's doing today at the University of Pennsylvania is really cutting edge. Uh, she does teach the honors program at the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing. They're undergraduate, they're best and brightest students that she really takes great pride in mentoring them to the next level so that they will be the stars that she has, has already become. Uh, in addition, she has a lot of programs that are both uh, national and international and has traveled to Armenia, the United Kingdom, Australia, Hong Kong, and most recently to Saudi Arabia uh, to teach either skills in gerontological nursing or in um, head and neck cancer or public health. I mean, it, she really runs the gamut. She's gotten all kinds of awards for excellence from uh, the Honor Society, Sigma Theta Tau, the Honor Society for Nursing, and she is also a recipient of the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Fellowship, better known as the Genius Award. Um, and she was the second nurse to get that uh, in 2004 and only the second gerontologist to, to get that. So, mm -hmm. Sarah, we are quite fortunate to have you today and for you to educate us with your vast experience, both nationally and internationally, on what you're doing. And I know that what you want to cover today is you want to really talk about, you know, although uh, head and neck cancer is relatively rare, and you'll talk about well, that, um, mm -hmm. but what we can do for it, you know, how people can be, you know, screened for it, how mm -hmm. do you know whether you're at risk for it, mm -hmm. you know, how do we compare with other countries, mm -hmm. Uh, and then what kind of support systems are out there and how does the team work with this? Because you're not only teaching this, but you're actually doing it. Um, right. So I'm going to let you start with maybe mm -hmm. how you even got involved with this kind of cancer. Well, that's, that's so nice of you. Um, thanks for the introduction. And um, I have been a career-long um, oncology nurse. I've been a nurse for about 28 years and have loved every minute of it. When I arrived at Penn, I really was focused on my broad interest, which is care for older people who have cancer of any sort, but probably about 17 years ago, I actually, funny story, stepped backward onto the foot of one of the head and neck surgeons <laughs> and turned around and thought, uh-oh, oh, interesting way of saying hello. Isn't it though? <laughs> um, and I was wearing heels at the time. Um, and actually uh, found myself engaged in a conversation with a surgeon, Dr. R. Chalian at the University of Pennsylvania, talking about the needs of older people who have had a neck cancer. Had a neck cancer does generally affect people in the later years, um, say from about 55 years onward. And that varies by what type of head and neck cancer we're talking about. But he and I started talking about what kinds of supports do these people need? What can we do to help those people diagnosed and being treated for head and neck cancer do in terms of living their lives better, being more comfortable, managing their symptoms? So 17 years later, I have had the incredible privilege of working with a vast number of patients who shared with me so much of their lives that I feel I'm able to kind of distill what I've learned from them, put it um, together with the knowledge that I have from my studies and from the research that I do, and then use it to help other people. So it's kind of like um, a, 
a cycle, a life cycle, where I get to help patients and in turn, I sort of become the person who lets them help other people in the future. That's wonderful. So you're, you're a real facilitator. Yes, So I absolutely. suppose you were supposed to step on that man's foot because he, he turned into a mentor. Absolutely. Um, we've been partners um, in uh, clinical care and research ever since. And one of the great things is that while I have particular interest in care of people who are diagnosed with cancer, my broader interest is in aging and particularly um, aging in a way that's healthy and individualized um, to what you want to do, how you want to live your life. And I always talk to my patients and their family members about the fact that cancer should never be what defines you. Rather, you should feel as though you can control and manage cancer and its treatment and your survivorship. Because remember, approximately one out of two people diagnosed today with any sort of cancer will go on to survive it. Um, so that means that we're really talking about a chronic process that may involve periods of treatment, but you have to really take hold of your life and say, what do I want to be doing right now and how can I do it best? And that's very exciting for me to do with patients and families because very often I think people are overwhelmed. They can kind of be startled by everything that's going on with them, for them, and around them. And they commonly need someone, and I think we as nurses um, find that it's most often a nurse who does that. We are the people who partner with patients and families to say, okay, let's get this under control. Let's make it manageable. Let's make it navigable. Right. I think that's an excellent point because um, I think the difference between the physician's role and the nurse's role, mm -hmm. as, as we are hearing from Sarah, is that the physicians are very focused on treatment, you mm -hmm. know, the actual treatment, whether it's surgical, it's radiological, it's uh, chemical, whatever is going to really like get that person uh, to a healthy state and get rid of those cancer cells. But what you're talking about is how are you going to live with cancer? That is really where the nurse takes on a very vital role. And I think Sarah is going to tell us about, you know, what are the components of that, you know, really what happens. But I think the point that she's made is that, again, most people don't think of, of cancer as something that they're going to live with maybe for 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years. Well, and you may actually go on um, to experience treatment and then um, to find that you have no evidence of that cancer anymore and you are going to enter into what we call cancer survivorship. Right. But what I think most of us think of as the rest of our lives. Right. What am I doing? What do I need to be concerned about? And remember, everyone is at risk. The longer we live, um, the more likely we are to have a risk of a particular cancer. I always like to remind people that head and neck cancers are relatively rare in this country. They account for a small percentage of our overall cancer incidence, that is the number of new cases we detect every year. But what people should recognize is that, and I've had so many patients tell me this, I never knew there was such a thing as head and neck cancer. And so what I want people to know is that yes, you can develop cancers of your tongue, your lips, your cheeks, mm -hmm. your jaw, as well as your throat. And your throat is divided by those of us who specialize into this area into several parts. But think of the fact that your throat has many components, and yes, you can develop a cancer there. So you want to know who can help me with that. And I think of two people who are really key in helping you understand do I have specific risk for mm -hmm. a particular head and neck cancer? And how should I be monitored or screened for that? That's a good point. The, how, how's, that, how's that work? So the two people you really want to turn to are your dentist. I remind people that you're not just going to your dentist for your teeth and getting your teeth cleaned. You're really going to your dentist for overall health. We know that oral health is related to our overall health in lots of ways. And one of the things a good dentist will always do is to inspect your mouth and feel your neck. How right, many of right, us can right, remember right. our dentist at our last exam feeling our neck? That is part of a physical examination screening for potential head and neck cancers, mouth, 
throat and neck. Right, because some of these things you could see, but some you wouldn't be able to see right. in the lower throat area. Absolutely. Um, well, or you might need special tools to see them right. because, of course, my surgeon colleagues can easily inspect the throat with endoscopic, um, that is, those little tubes that they can send down through your nose. But what you want your dentist to do is to be really looking your mouth, looking under your tongue, looking in your cheeks, and looking at the back of your throat. Uh, right. which your dentist can easily do, as well as feeling your neck for what we would think of as swollen glands or, more properly, um, enlarged lymph nodes mm -hmm. that may signal a need for further evaluation. Not right. that you have cancer, but a need for further evaluation. Right, so it's a first line of defense. Exactly. So that's another reason why it's important to go every year. Yes. It's very important to um, recognize that oral health is part of your overall health, and most dentists will recommend annual exams plus cleaning twice a year. Mm -hmm. So that's the first part. And then the second part is that you want a primary care provider, either a physician or a nurse practitioner, who knows you and knows your overall health habits, your health behaviors, your family history, to be able to help you as a person identify what are my specific risks for cancer, cardiovascular disease, and other chronic non-communicable diseases like diabetes, for example. How do those all fit together? What should I be doing to take optimal care of myself? And what kind of screening do I need, specialized screening um, and general health screening in order that I can stay healthy and live the life I want to live. Right. Well, that, they're all good points. How common is uh, head and neck cancer? Overall, head and neck cancers account for about 6 to 7% mm -hmm. of all cancers here in the United States. But it's much more common in some other parts of the world. For example, men in France still have a very high um, likelihood of throat cancer, of what we call laryngeal or voice box cancer. Mm -hmm. People in Southeast Asia have a higher risk of nasopharyngeal cancer, um, sort of in the back of uh, your th throat at the top, mm -hmm. is what we call the nasopharynx. And what, what are the causes in those countries of that? In so general, specific to those areas. We tend to think about viral causes, um, like a virus called Epstein-Barr virus, mm -hmm. um, as well as some other factors that have to do with environmental exposures and dietary exposures. Mm -hmm. Many of these equations are not perfectly sorted out. We don't know all the evidence, but we do have a good suggestion that certainly here in North America, just as in Europe, the two big problems, the two big factors in your risk for head and neck cancer are smoking, mm -hmm. um, tobacco use, and drinking, and any kind of smoking, whether it's cigarettes, pipes, cigars, water pipes, can put you at risk for head and neck as well as other cancers. I see. So that's really something to think about, you know, again, in prevention terms, you know, so really uh, stopping the use of uh, tobacco or uh, drinking moderately rather than excessively, that may have Absolutely. something to do with these viruses too, how they um, potentiate the viruses. We don't know about that particular piece, but you're absolutely right. And we talk to our patients about this all the time. Um, no use of tobacco, including chewing or using snuff or snus, is a good idea. It puts you at risk for a mm -hmm. host of health problems. And for tobacco users who also drink, there is an additive effect for certain head and neck cancers between the tobacco use and the alcohol use. And you're right that, again, um, speaking more as a geriatric nurse now um, than just exclusively as an oncology nurse, Drinking alcohol is only a good idea in moderation. And remember that women have to drink less than men to achieve that idea of moderation. Right, right. So in terms of other risk factors, how about family history, of course? That would certainly be something that people uh, need to be aware of. It is, though we don't see um, strong family patterns mm -hmm. in most head and neck cancers. Mm -hmm. um, so that is something that your primary care provider should be aware of, but um, it is either the case that we're not quite sure what the major carcinogens are for certain particular sites within the group that we call head and neck cancers, mm -hmm. or we know that um, overridingly tobacco and alcohol together and tobacco alone are really the problem forces 
in head and neck cancers. Right. So really, it is somewhat of a mystery as to how this all works together. Well, remember that what we are learning about cancer is an evolving story, mm -hmm. and that story changes on a day-to-day -day basis sometimes. And anyone who's been listening to the news and trying to make sense of those news reports understands, wow, we're learning new things every day. One of the ideas that I think is important to recognize is that you don't do something to get cancer. Sometimes, as an author um, uh, who has cancer has said, a, a lot like other people, more, most recently Valerie Harper, who's been in the news with her brain cancer, sometimes people just get sick. Mm -hmm. What we do understand is that as people age, um, there is a phenomenon called um, epigenetic causes of disease. That is, nothing in um, later life is generally explicitly genetic. Rather, it has to do with the fact that your genetic material is influenced by the exposures from where you live, what you eat, what you breathe, all sorts of things over your lifetime. And so those epigenetic forces often result in diseases, and we're still sorting out right. what that science right. means. Right, exactly. So, I mean, there's a lot to really be discovered, you know, as we go forward. Very much. But while we're talking about causal factors, how about the HPV virus? I mean, there's been a yeah. lot in the news about how this affects head and neck cancer. Absolutely, Nancy, and I'm so glad you brought that up because I think that my colleagues who are ENTs or otorhinolaryngologists would probably say that's the most frequent um, question they're getting today. Mm -hmm. um, HPV, human papillomavirus, is a virus that we know um, is connected to cervical cancer, mm -hmm. and that's one of the reasons that we're seeing um, HPV vaccination of young children, particularly young girls, but mm -hmm. also now young boys. What we found um, in the past, I would say, five to seven years is that HPV probably plays a role in a very specific type of head and neck cancer called oropharyngeal cancer. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people are very anxious about it because they may have recognized that uh, their spouses or partners um, have a known HPV infection that's resolved, and all of a sudden the worry is, wow, are we now at risk for oropharyngeal cancers? And I always take the conservative approach, and that is, this is very new science. Mm -hmm. We're still learning a great deal about the relationship between this virus and this specific type of head and neck cancer. It's important to remember that most HPV infections actually resolve for people without them sometimes ever knowing that they've had the infection and without any long-term consequences. Well, that's good because the first question I think most people would say is, oh my goodness, if I might have it, what am I going to see? What right. would I look for? And you wouldn't look for anything. Rather, what you would want to do is, again, to go back to my first suggestion, that you want your primary care right. provider right. to know that your partner has, for example, been diagnosed with HPV and that you're concerned about it. Because it's really important to be honest about, I'm anxious about this. And then your primary health care provider, your nurse or your physician, can say, okay, let's figure this out. May it help um, to have an ENT, uh, a doctor who specializes in mm -hmm. ear, nose, and throat, or otorhinolaryngology, um, do an examination? Absolutely. It, that may be helpful, but your first resource is your primary care provider who can talk to you about whether you've actually had an infection, about the fact that Rem remembering that most infections don't result in anything, that good health habits and good screenings are the most important part mm -hmm. of this. And believing that you will get a particular type of cancer because you've had a specific infection is missing the fact that the equation is not one and one equals two. Right, right. But would you say that uh, some people are reluctant to share that information with their primary care physician because there is a sexual connotation to this and there's a sexual uh, aspect of this. I mean, that's how people Certainly. are going to, uh, to transmit I, this. I think we're all anxious about um, discussing private topics, um, anxieties, 
about sex, about death. There are lots of ways in which your primary care provider can help you with that. But I would say, in my experience, the first thing to recognize is that if you have a good overall relationship with the person who provides your right. basic health care, it's going to be a lot easier to say, I have something to talk about that makes me really nervous. Right. Can you help me talk about it? That's a very good line. I think what Sarah just gave you is the prompt because first of all, you don't want to be shy. You know, more information that you're sharing with your, your primary care treater, whether it's a nurse uh, practitioner, a physician assistant, uh, the uh, physician primary care provider, whoever it is that you are really banking on, so to speak, you know, to help you. This is your obligation to do this because they, what they don't know, they can't really use to help you. So part of what we're trying to do with our show is to give those prompts to people, you know, so that they can feel more comfortable having those conversations. Mm -hmm. And I think that what Sarah just said is admit it's tough to talk about. You know, it makes you anxious, but you're going to talk about it anyway. Exactly. Thank you for that. I and think you're going to help a lot of people just with that prompt. It's, it's sometimes just remembering that if you recognize both you and your health care provider know you're human. We're all human. Right. And if we just come out with the way we're feeling, then the ideas we have to talk about are much easier. And the same thing is true if you are facing a potential diagnosis of cancer, I find, that many of us are just terrified by the word cancer. Or we may be so anxious that we don't hear information, right. whether we're asking about cancer screening or asking about a cancer diagnosis. And that's the point at which I remind my patients, and sometimes I even coach them. I say, okay, so say after me, I'm really scared to talk about this. Can you help me with it? Right. Um, or I don't know how to say this, but the ideas that I'm thinking about are, and then you just fill in the blank. Right. So that's a very good way, you know, that you really are using in your own practice with patients and their families. Mm -hmm. And let's go back to that, because I think that part of what Sarah has told us is that in her practice at, at Penn, mm -hmm. she not only teaches the nursing students on how to do this, and they're, they're the future pipeline of, of, of expertise, okay. but in her practice, when she walks across the street from the school, to the hospital, she's actually dealing with with real people, mm -hmm. uh, people that are facing this crisis. And I think it is very hard for people to even hear after they hear the word cancer to think that they have a life mm -hmm. because it's so iffy. You mm -hmm. know, you may be too far gone to have a life. Um, you may be at the beginning of your diagnosis and you may have 25 years ahead of you. So how do you really help people sort out their fears from the reality of what they are going to have to deal with. How do you really get that conversation started? Well, the first thing I do is remind people that there's an entire team of experts who want nothing more than to help them. And that they should start by recognizing that a lot of what we think we know about cancer is actually incorrect. For example, most people assume that cancer is a death sentence, and they still believe that. And I meet many older individuals, mm -hmm. for example, who can remember their relatives dying of cancer as children, and those images have remained with them. And that is a point at which I say, let's remember we're in the 21st century, and treatment and treatment options have advanced remarkably for all cancers, and especially in the field of he head and neck cancer, where we now are able to use surgery, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, as well as a variety of adjuvant measures, including speech-language pathology, um, to help you ensure that your voice and your ability to eat are intact, um, physical therapy, so that your physical function, particularly if your surgery has affected your sh shoulders mm -hmm. or your radiation has affected your neck, that your physical function is what it should be, what it, it was essentially before treatment. And that's the time when I just get to know an individual and mm -hmm. say, let's talk about what you're really concerned about so that we can separate fact from fiction and myth from the truth. And the truth is that 
All of us are going to die at some point. It's really how we live our lives, and my patients have told me this in so many ways, so many times, that I would be remiss if I didn't say it. Right. And that is, you have to learn how to live your life and integrate the cancer into it rather than feeling as though cancer has threatened your life and is taking your life right. over. That, that is so healthy. But I can tell you that even in my own lifetime, mm -hmm. uh, my um, maternal grandfather, who we all adored, was mm -hmm. the nicest person we had ever met um, and was very healthy. He mm -hmm. was in his 80s. Mm -hmm. He had a patch on his tongue, mm -hmm. and he died a horrific death of head and mm -hmm. neck cancer. That only came out, you know, as I've been interviewing you and some right. other people in this yeah. field because I had uh, suppressed that in, in that it was so painful for everyone, mm -hmm. but particularly for him. Certainly. Because there weren't those treatments that you've talked about. That's right. So there'll be people that are listening to this show that will have had very similar experiences. Absolutely. Whether it's head or neck cancer, but other people that they've known very close to that have really died really very unfortunately, very painful deaths. But that's not today. Today Definitely is not. a whole different world. And that's, I think, the hope that you're giving us. Absolutely. Um, I tell people that they should expect to receive cutting edge therapy. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those therapies, just like taking an antibiotic is not without its side effects, cancer therapy is not without its side effects, is not without its impact on your daily life. But we have the ability to effectively treat almost all cancers today. The earlier we detect them, the easier it is to treat them. Right. And that's true again for all cancers. Right. And it's important to recognize that cancer care has, it ev has evolved to such an extent that we now have specialists who focus on voice, who focus on diet and nutrition, who focus on um, your social needs and getting you the resources you, you require to live well, on your mental health and how you're feeling emotionally, on your spiritual needs, as well as on um, coordinating all of that. And that's really where nurses come in to help pull everything together. So many people will think about, well, I'll have a doctor, or maybe I'll have several doctors, mm -hmm. but what I want everyone to know is that in addition to your doctors and the nurses you come to know, who often practice with those physicians, you're going to have access in any cancer center um, across the United States. You're going to have access, and this is an expectation from the Institute of Medicine. You're going to have access to people who can help you with every other aspect of your life right. so that Whatever your question and concern, there's going to be someone, even if it's not me, who will help you. So I, if I, I always say to patients, if I don't know the answer to your question, you can bet your bottom dollar that I know who does. Right, right. And that's something that I hope helps people feel as though they're not alone. Because sometimes I think even with a wonderful family, you can think, wow, I've got cancer, what am I going to do? And feel very alone right. I in think, that process. I think that isolation is the mm -hmm. hardest part. Yeah. I mean, once you hear the words and you're just trying to digest the reality and then you have to face all these various treatment options, even that alone to translate what that's going to mean and what you're going to experience, having someone like Sarah, and as she said, this is really the expectation, no matter where you're treated, that you will have other people who are doing this kind of translational work for you so that you really don't have to be isolated. But it's also, I think, important for people to ask for some of this, too, to, to be able to do the, the reciprocal reaching out because it is your life. I mean, you exactly. have to use these people to coach you into a new experience. And if I could just underline that, Nancy, um, I tell people, don't be afraid to ask any question, even if you think it might not be a question. Right. Um, so don't be afraid to ask. The other thing that I remind people um, to recognize is that sometimes it is difficult to ask. So try to find a partner. Maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a family member. Um, who can help you ask when you're finding it difficult. Right, right. So you really need a partner in this. So you really, at the end of this, of this discussion, I think what we've learned is that Sarah has really helped us to understand that you do have partners in care and that people like Sarah 
uh, who are nurses, very experienced and very knowledgeable, can, can help you. And you need to access that wherever you, you can. So I would like to say thank you to Sarah, uh, Dr. Sarah Kagan, who is with us today from the uh, School of Nursing at the University of Pennsylvania and the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. You can see she is a wealth of knowledge. Any wonder she got the MacArthur Genius Award. I mean, you are a genius. And she's down to earth. She's a nurse. Thank you so much for being with us. And thank you again, Sarah, for sharing your knowledge with us today. Thank you, Nancy. It was a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed our conversation today and that the information will help you in meeting your health goals. Catch this program and other conversations on the website, drnancyrn.com. Or you can write to me as well. I welcome your comments and feedback. Thank you for listening and join us again. And remember, with health, all things are possible.